Archiving started.
Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? How about now? How about now? My guess is My that guess it's is been that from Boston. Hopefully, it will be on my Yeah, for the rest yeah, of the class. All right, so we're talking oh, about the science degree. Jobs that are jobs available. That are available. Oh, I get love. I get love. Uh, every week. Every week. Uh, for people, uh, how, for how people, about now? How about the now? The echo's on? The echo's on? I can hear it a little I bit. I can hear it a little bit. Still an echo. Still echo is echo. terrible. Well, we're well, archiving it. Um, um, all I can say with that is probably, uh, probably, uh, it's probably uh, win by. Probably win by. So, so well, let's move on let's to today as quickly as possible. As possible. Um, uh, those of you who are here over time, you cannot fix the schedule at all. I cannot fix the schedule at all. I'm not sure what that means, Barbara. We will do the best we can here. It's a cross-disciplinary program. Uh, with Sal, Sal, Long Pond, Long Pond. I think this is probably the best, is probably of, the all best of, them. of all of them. Um, um, we're going to get through the intro here, and I'm going to turn, 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 turn it over to Dave, and hopefully Dave, Dave will, will not have any, any, any echo. Any echo. Um, uh, so, 
So if you want any information, you want any information on it, on it let's get to the, 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 the final the final thing here. Final Contact me at Baggio, B-A-G-G-I-O, at the sal dot I would like I to like now turn now this over to Dave Goodman. Uh, Dave, uh, hopefully you're going to have better luck with the audio than I am. I am. So, uh, so why don't you take uh, it, Dave, and we'll go, from there. we'll go from there. Thank you, Bobby. Just let's do a sound check for myself because I don't like to sound like swimming in water and all this echo. Can everyone hear me fine? Okay. Thanks a lot. Mm-hmm. Bobby, do you control the screen now? Thank you. So what we're going to do today is give you some information about learning in the brain, and I'll give you some background. For the past three years, Soft Assist has attended the national conferences on learning in the brain, and they are presented by Harvard, Johns Hopkins, I believe Mayo, Stanford, uh, Massachusetts General, etc. Very high-level Uh, research on how people learn everything from how infants all the way through adults. And so my purpose in going there is to see if there's anything we can take back for us in the adult learning world. So I'm going to focus on maybe three specific things or three uh, takeaways that we may be able to use within our courses. So for today's session, we're going to be talking about perspectives, emotions, and then some of the specific elements uh, about learning and how the brain plays a part in all of those elements. So the first thing in terms of perspective, when we approach a course, we may or may not know it, but we automatically put ourselves into a bind or a structure. And usually we begin a course and we have an opening page. Then there's a page about how long the course is going to be. We move into the learning objectives. We move into like the terminal objectives, how long the course is in terms of how much time is devoted to an assessment or knowledge checks. So the actual course does not take place until about screen seven. And so right there, by that structure, we have already lost the majority of the students and the adult learners who are taking the course. So one way to actually kind of grab attention is to do away with all those front seven pages. It's up to you to uh, have that same material if you like, but put it either as in an attachment within your course or you can scatter it throughout the course but there's really no reason why you wish to set up a roadblock for those first seven screens because if that's the case, you then need to regenerate interest by the time you get on to screen seven. And I'll show you some examples of what I mean there. The next bullet point really is emotions. What we're finding out is most courses from an adult level point of view have very little emotions built into the course. Yet we know that the emotional aspect of our nature is what really brings our greatest attention to the task, whether that emotion is fear or anger or love, etc. We know that emotions are critical, but yet in design courses, we rarely have a chance or we have the opportunity of using emotions, and we don't. This is a a very small, uh, quick study. AST did it, I think it was 2010, January 2010, maybe off a year. But the most important part of the entire study was from a a learner's perspective. They found that the greatest uh, advantage for them was 20% before they even started the course is how were they treated? What were the expectations? Was the course easy to access? Uh, did you give me feedback, et cetera, as the manager? The actual training course, whether it's in the classroom or the online, 
only received 20% value from the learner's point of view. The majority of all the value is in what happens after the class is done, whether it's the classroom or the online piece. That is where the learner says they can see and have and feel the greatest amount of value. And most instructional designers never even touch that third area called post-learning. We do the course. At the end of the course, you have an assessment, and then we stop. But from the learner's perspective, they're looking for how do you treat me after the course is over? Do you email me? Do you talk to me? Do you regroup so that we who learn at the same time may be able to participate in the ongoing learning? So we need to start to focus on what happens after the formal training. And again, we'll talk about that later on. So in the very beginning, we have already set up some roadblocks in terms of those first five, six, seven screens before we even get into the course. We then have to regenerate people's interests, et cetera. And then on this slide, we almost lose 50% of value by not thinking about what happens next. So here are just a few slides of the typical course. As I said, it's the opening course. You have your goals and your objectives and different things. And people argue and they say, well, if I do away with the page on course objectives, how will they know what my course is about? Well, if your course isn't well designed, they will not know what your course is about. But if your course is well designed, then those objectives will be able to come through on every screen. You can always have, as I mentioned, your goals and your objectives in an attachment that they see separately so it does not disturb the flow of the screen. And this idea of flow is very important from the learning and the brain aspect. Because any, any disruption in the flow while you're learning actually stops the process of learning, and then the brain must re-engage uh, re itself. So if you have things on the screen that it will block a person's attention span, we're losing them. So here's a little bit of uh, art background. When I was in art school, and I'd be looking at a painting, and I couldn't quite understand what was going wrong in the painting. Something was not in quite balance. And I had a teacher, and they gave me a mirror, and they asked me to turn my back and look at the painting through the mirror. And as soon as I did that, the errors of my ways in the painting popped out because the way my eye and brain were working was different than when I looked at straight on. And I think when we look at our course, we have a, a maybe a myopic point of view, and we don't see the errors or the flaws in our way. So we had to come up with some technique that is similar to the mirror, looking at a course from a different perspective. So what I'm suggesting is when you start to begin a course, try not to put yourself in a bind by following your set patterns, because if the set patterns really do not add value, then let's kind of remove them or handle them in a different way and focus on those things that have the most value. So we get into the emotion part. We start putting some things together. So I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to ask a question, and then I'll let you vote on that. In terms of um, you have an assignment, and the assignment is for you to create a course on workplace harassment. And you can pick religious harassment, sexual harassment, age harassment. It really doesn't matter. But the issue is, and here's your question, when you create a course like harassment, did you ever change the perspective of the course? Or did your course go on in terms of here are the topics, Here's the definition. Here are the legal issues. Here's what you can do. Here's what you can't do. And here are the forms you must do. 
that would be your normal approach in a training course. And so what we're talking about now is how would you insert emotions into that training course? So the question is, when you designed the course, did you use a different perspective in your design? Let me just stop for a little bit and see if you can do a quick vote. Who's Joe Paterno? Wow. Seven. Seven. Lecture mode is now on. Has anyone been listening to the previous? Has anyone heard the past 10 minutes of this course? Thank you. So I'm getting some feedback here that it was, there's no audio on. Are you able to vote? Are you able to use your icons in the bottom of the page for check mark and X? Okay. Okay, since we obviously something's going wrong with the voting, so let me just move on and I'll give you an example of the question I'm really asking. So normally when we design the course, we put ourselves into a structure and our brains are moving according to that structure. I have to have content on five chapters. I have to have four slides per chapter. I have to do certain things. So all of that is basically backfilling a process that may be good, but it doesn't really engage the brain fully. So here's the, uh, an option for you. If you're going to do a course on harassment, Again, whichever topic within harassment, supposing you did the course from the perspective of the person being accused, not the person who was harassed, but from the accuser's point of view, you can achieve the same amount of con same amount of legal issues, same amount of forms, etc. The very fact that you changed the perspective and you did it from the accused point of view keeps the learner's attention much higher throughout the entire course. It's one of those unknown, unexpected things, and so the human brain will always look for that which is different, that which is not to be expected, because the brain is looking for threats and security. And so they need to pay attention to the course because they don't quite understand the idea that the course is being presented from the abuser's point of view. And so, therefore, you have captured their attention. So here are just some of the ideas that you can do in your next course just for the idea of trying to create some emotional aspects in your course. And so when you write your course, and you can read this yourself, you can ask, how would you feel? You can also design the course from the person's family's perspective or from the colleague's perspective, how they feel in the office, still having to work day in, day out, next to the person who was the abuser and the person who was abused. So trying to encourage other people's emotions or perspectives or backgrounds into your course really captures the engagement of the learning. So this illustration is probably one of the most critical of the, the entire PowerPoint. And you may have seen this before, and this was used throughout the conference, and the conference was in DC in 2010. And the biggest pyramid says that most of our courses are text on the screen or lectures, someone talking at us or listening to the media, and as you can see on your right-hand side, the amount of retention for those types of courses is very low. If you want to obtain 75, 90% or higher attention, you have to build into your course either practice sessions or the ability 
for the learners to teach other people. So remember, going back into the second slide, 54% of the value is what happens after the class. So if you are able to build into your learning programs and to have other people 30, 45 days out teach a small mini module on harassment to the same cohorts or same groups of people who have taken the course or have people share their experience about what happened once the course was done and they can then uh, share and or teach. Once you do some of those issues, the actual retention rate for the entire group goes up and therefore your success factors in the training program increases dramatically. When we turn the mics back on, we'll be able to uh, go through each of these in a little more depth and kind of talk it out. So here are some uh, five or six things directly from the Brain Conference. So on the right-hand side, it's the threats and the safety. And then what do you do as the instructional designer to decrease the feeling of threats and safety? And so the image here that was used is when the fox comes out of their lair the next morning, first thing they do is look around to see what is different. And so everything they see that is different from the night before, they have to make a very quick decision to say, is that a threat? Is, am I safe? Until they reach that point, they really cannot do anything else. They don't look for food. They don't fight. They don't walk around until they resolve the idea of threats and safety. So us as instructional designers, what can we do in our course that reduces the learner's anxiety. So one person said that they spend a lot of time designing courses and their first screens are, if you don't pass this with an 85%, you will not be certified. If you don't pass this, you will not be able to use the new ERP system. So those are threats, the same thing as what the fox would feel. So if, as I said before, if we're spending a lot of time in a structure or if we're spending some time overcoming threats, the brain cannot kick in and listen to what is being presented in the training courses. So the rule number one is on your uh, first screen, see if there's anything that is threatening that you can remove from the training program. The issue, next issue is uncertainty. When the brain is in a position of uncertainty, that really becomes another fear factor. They do not know what to do with uncertainty. And they look around for our brains or look around for where can I put this uncertainty that's related to something else that I know and that I can relate to and therefore reduce the level of uncertainty. So we had created a course on statistics and for many people out of college for a while, the stat courses may have been a threat. They weren't quite certain what to do. And so some of the early portions of the course was bringing, them, bringing the learners up to speed in a slow manner about stat and how it relates to things on their job that they are already doing. And then they can recognize, oh, I understand now this is about this specific job or this specific analysis. I've done this before. I can remember this. I'll look some stat things up later. So we're always reducing the level of uncertainty. The second thing after the fear has overcome, the brain looks for that curiosity and creativity. And I go back to the idea of the emotions. So when we change who the speaker is from the person being accused and we have a perspective of the accuser, that is in itself a high level of curiosity and creativity, and that's why I had mentioned the learners will actually pick up on that in a much greater manner and pay more attention because of, of the creativity. The emotional aspect, again, in any, some of your courses, I realize, may not be as emo emotional as we want it to be, but in those courses where you can engage some emotion, 
that heightens the value of the course for the learner because the emotions actually has uh, what, what's happening, you're creating additional pathways to the brain. So just as an example, each of us has a memory. And those memories that are near and dear to us that are most emotional for us, we can remember the people in a situation 25 years ago. We know what they look like, what they wore, where we were, if there was music in the background, or if there was an aroma or a scent. All those things come back to us every time we recall that incident. And that was because we had created multiple pathways that reinforced that specific image. So in the course, what we're trying to do there is also create multiple pathways, either in the images that we use, our narration, the value of our assessments, the learning aspects, uh, what we're asking the learners to do in terms of activities after the program. So all of that is about the, the value and the pathways that we're creating. The next one is the intrinsic motivation. What's in it for me? So when we start a course, and going back to the harassment course, most people say, this is one of my compliance courses. I'm forced to take it once a year. Let me get through it. Let me go right to the assessments, take the assessment, and they lose the intrinsic value. If there's a way for, um, for us to have an intrinsic value in the course, such as in compliance, every time the company is sued $5 million because of somebody that was non-compliant, that $5 million needs to come out of some part of the budget. And that may affect me. So that's a small way, but we can maybe explain some things in the course that talks about the intrinsic value of what's in it for me. And the last thing is the improved status. People ride around in fancy cars. They live in certain houses. They have certain jewelry. That's all status. So in the same thing is how do we increase the status of our learners on these screens? And that is simple things of giving simple feedback more frequently throughout the course, not just associated feedback with a, an assessment, but just small things about you're doing a good job, we're halfway through, things like that. At the bottom of the screens, you can put small quotes that would reinforce. You can put a small, like a one-liner of encouragement. Anything of that nature will be uh, perceived as a status improvement. Three last points. Again, this is all from the conference. <clears throat> During the your screen designs, ask the learner to predict what, what what do you think will happen in this harassment case? Do you think the person will be charged as guilty? The idea of predicting engages the brain to think ahead and use different types of critical thinking that are different than just reading the screen or taking the course. You're now asking them to do something that is outside the norm. The alert. The alerts are, as the example here says, in lesson three, we will we'll define something. So the alert just says, um, I'm telling you now Something's going to happen seven screens from now. Again, going back to the fox, alerting. So the fox is always on the alert for another animal in the area or something going wrong. In our case, putting alerts in our training program allows us to keep the engagement of the learner. And the last bullet is, again, this is from a specific study, ASTD. And they, had, they showed a 17% increase in the retention and the completion rate of the course when the instructional designer placed various types of questions in the course, again, I'd say at the bottom of the page. And this is one example of an actual question. Do you think that you are fully alert 
to comprehend the content. They just ask the question. And the very fact of asking the question puts the brain on alert, and the brain basically says, I better pay more attention. So that simple question forced the person to come back into full engagement into the course. And I believe this is our last slide. And so in a very simple manner, we want to sting, S-T-I-N-G, our courses. So the S says, did we actually maximize the amount of senses in the course? Not just the reading and the listening, but did we do anything else that would increase the use of our senses? Every increase of sense used in a course increases the amount of pathways, the increased use of pathways increases both the short-term and long-term retrieval, and we're able to retrieve the course in a much more rapid manner. So anything that we can do to increase the pathways actually improves your course. The T is for touch. Did we touch the people? This is the emotional aspect, and you can do that in many ways. I get a lot of pushback on if I have to do a compliance course or stat course, there's not too emotion there. But I think if we just took a break and, and thought of how can we do something that would be emotional. And so sometimes we would use tricks like uh, our opening screen may be the front page of a news headline about the course we're taking. So it may be on risk management. So the article could be uh, Ajax Insurance Company loses $12 million, and as you roll over the article, different things could pop up, and then you can begin your course. So even though the course topic may be dry, there's ways of getting the emotional aspect. So the I is your intrinsic. What's in it for me? N is your neurons. You're creating additional pathways. Uh, more pathways, obviously, is the retrieval increase. And G, the last one, I think we fall into a habit of wanting to create good courses, but we sometimes don't really push ourselves into creating a great course. And if we sat down and we said, here is a course, and there's 40 screens, and it's a very good course, it looks good, but it, it's just good. What can I do to actually make it a great course? And if you go back through some of the slides in terms of did you increase the emotional value, did you increase the, the intrinsic value, were you able to lessen their threat, did you put a little question or alert in there, did you ask the people to project. These small things that came out of the conference, I think if we're able to use them in our course, we would be able to really push more, more of our courses from good courses to great courses. And I think I'm on my last slide now. We'll try to stay within our, our limitation here. So one, I just want to appreciate and thank you for staying attention and uh, bearing with me. And I'm just showing four uh, future webinars that we're doing. And I have to work out some of the uh, times with Bobby. But we're going to be doing a session on designing backwards. It's a performance-based instructional design the reasons for project failure, a general overview on the learning environment, like the SCORM issues, CMS issues, LMS issues, assessments, and things like that. What are some of the new things that are happening in the marketplace, like gaming? And the last one is how do you manage and budget a project? So those are just four future topics. If you like today's topic, I ask you to please come back and enjoy yourself again. Bobby, I'm done. And if you can open the mic for some questions, that would be great. Lecture mode is now off. Are there any questions?
Bobby, are you coming back on to manage the uh, the Q&A period? Very little. It's like an audio, an audio nightmare, folks. I know there's static. My guess is that uh, just WIPA and uh, product is bought out. And not bought out. Uh, I'm going to turn this over to Dave. If you have Dave, questions, type them in the chat. I can't promise you that I will do my best to get it to the flat the next time. Uh, so if you have any questions, type them in the chat. Lecture mode is now on. This thing slide is on. Right. Here's one question from Patty about the ends in the neurons. How do you create? How do you increase the neurons? The issue is um, either through senses. So if your if your course is strictly uh, a text-based course, remember going back to the triangle. If it's a text-based course, minimal neurons. If it's text plus narration plus the pictures plus uh, other activities, either in the way you do your assessments, the way you do some emotional pull, the, your instructional value for uh, doing your harassment course from the abuser's point of view, all of those things shake up the brain and create different neuron pathways to actually retrieve the data. If it's going to be a straight text type of course, 
then you're creating a basically a single pathway. As you add more possibilities of either your senses, your emotions, your perspective, they all create the additional pathways, and that is what's going to be increasing your retrieval rates. A question is uh, for Tracy. A question is from Tracy is about can you overdo the emotional uh, rate? You can, obviously. The issue that I would respond with is if the instructional designer is doing that, my first question would be is that instructional designer in a rut? Are they approaching that because that's the way all other courses were designed using the patient for the emotional aspect? That's one issue. The second issue is some corporations do not like the idea of using the emotions in your course, and they basically tell you not to do it that way. If you're able to get around the emotional aspect using the patient time in, time in, again, uh, then I'll give you an example. We had done a course for, again, a medical a company, and so the course was on the same topics, but the one perspective came from the physician, the one perspective came from the patient, one perspective came from a hospital worker. So the perspectives were broken up for the emotional aspect and which is really trying to give multiple points of view. So I agree with you. If you overuse emotions, it may not work. But if you try emotions more often and do it in multiple perspectives, I think you'll be able to get away with it very nicely. I yep. Like Thanks a lot to everyone else. Now off.